World War I defined the 21st century in every possible way. Culturally, economically, politically. It caused the Russian Revolution. It drove empires to the brink of collapse. It destroyed the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It brought the US into European affairs for the very first time. It drove the British and the French empires into heavy debt and set the stage for World War II. We might say that mentioning any significant development during the last century without mentioning World War I is inadequate, really. World War I, also known as the Great War, began in 1914 after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. His murder catapulted Europe into a war that lasted until 1918. During the conflict, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empires, together composing the Central Powers, fought against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan and the United States, which composed the Entente. Thanks to new military technologies and the horror of trench warfare, World War I saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction. By the time the war was over and the, the Entente claimed victory, more than 16 million people, soldiers and civilians alike, were dead. It's really hard for us to reckon how bad it was for these people. New technologies like the machine gun and biological warfare had just been invented and they were supposed to end all wars, make it so terrifying and horrible that they would never get used and war would be too nasty to ever get fought again. There would be a quick victory and that would be it. Instead this terrible war kept dragging on for years and years and years. So if we want to see a different timeline and how a different historical development could have changed in order to make it so the central powers one, World War One. then we first must first analyze why they lost. World War One was an incredibly equal and close-fought war that dragged on endlessly. And there was many times where either side could have won. The Central Powers had the disadvantage at the beginning of the war of having to fight on two fronts. The West Front with France and the East Front with Russia and Serbia and the like. This worsened as Germany's invasion of France through Belgium brought the UK into war. That then enticed Italy with promises of lands in the Balkans. Secondly, there was the control of the oceans that the Entente enjoyed, which is a foregone conclusion if Germany invades Belgium and thus drags the UK, the world's biggest naval power in, and Italy one step below, but still a good power house. Really, the way that central powers could have won is by focusing their efforts and going east first. With Germany being less ambitious in the west, and instead using Belgium and the Netherlands as a natural buffer zone, as they are afraid of British involvement in the war, should they compromise their neutrality. Thus they only invade Luxembourg and focus on their defense along Alsace Lorraine, which requires much smaller troops on a much smaller border front. Such a strategy would, one, free up lots of units that could be used elsewhere, secondly, not drag the UK in as an active combatant, and thirdly, result in Italy not joining the Entente, as they do not see the opportunity to gain Italian-speaking land from Austria-Hungary, and thus lead them to honor the terms of the Triple Alliance that were signed between Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, which stated that in the event of a war between Austria-Hungary and Russia, Italy promised to remain neutral. This means a lot easier naval warfare in the Mediterranean, and most importantly, no western border for the unruly and unrest-prone Austria-Hungary that was already struggling the war against Serbia and Russia. The war begins as per usual, but the Germans do a more defensive stance on the Western Front. Things doesn't start changing until the 7th of August, when the French invade Alsace towards Mulhausen and days later an even larger offensive against Lorraine follows. Both offensives are a fiasco and the French gets beaten back with great losses. At the beginning of September, Germany conquers the mining area along Longueuil and Brie and begins bunkering down. The front stabilizes and trench warfare ensues. New French attacks start in October, but they fail to make any real headway and the Western Front stays as a bloody stalemate. 
However, British loans keep the French war industry going. The French keep trying, with a new huge attack in 1916, but the attack fails to capture any noticeable amount of land and results in hundreds of thousands dead. With most of the death toll being on the French sides, the attackers, many see the wars as a madness, aching to banging your head against a brick wall repeatedly, hoping for anything to change, and protests start to break out. On the Eastern Front, things are quite a little bit different from start to finish here. With less enemies and more focus, things will develop differently. Russia pours troops over the border, but their first battle is really in 1914, the Battle of Tannenberg, which ends in a disaster with over 30,000 Russian troops killed or wounded and 90,000 captured, while Germany suffered just 12,000 casualties. In Galicia, the Russians are initially successful, however, and the Austria-Hungarian army is driven back and the Germans are forced to come to the aid of the Austrians and aid in a large-scale counter-offensive, expelling the Russians by October. Another successful offensive by the Central Powers involves the encirclement of the Russian army, which are facing a serious shortages in 1915. Sir Nicholas, seeing the development, takes direct command of the army and personally oversees Russia's main field of war, leaving his ambitious but incapable wife Alexandra in charge of the government with the rest of the court with plenty of opportunities to mingle with Rasputin. It is around this time that reports of corruption and incompetence in the imperial armor government begins to emerge, and the scandal of a potential affair between the Queen and Grigory Rasputin that would normally derail most normal affairs is only viewed with resentment for now. Back at the border, the front line keeps shifting east as Russia loses ground. Next, Germany conquers the Baltic provinces and then he sends a peace of proposal to the Tsar. Of course, the proposal is reacted. There's plenty of time left. What king would give up so easily, especially as there's still plenty of room for the tide of war to change if Britain joins the war? Well, Britain does not join the war, and the initially supportive citizens have by now grown war-weary and seeing the Tsar again and again fail to fulfill his most basic duty of guaranteeing the security of the populace within the empire. While the outbreak of the war had initially quieted social and political protests, this patriotic unity did not last for long as war weariness gradually took its toll. Although many ordinary Russians joined anti-German demonstrations in the first few weeks of the war, hostility towards the Kaiser and their desire to defend their home and their lives did not necessarily translate into enthusiasm for the Tsar or the government. The Russian Empire was filled with plenty of non-Russians, after all. In 1916, the Russians had recovered and were able to launch three major offensives. Only the Brusilov offensive against the Austro-Hungarian army were initially successful. However, by now, Germany gets Romania on its side as they seized the opportunity to gain back their native lands in Russia. Via Romania, Brusilov is attacked from behind and defeated. Over in the Balkans, the Austrian-Hungarian invasion of Serbia was initially unsuccessful and it wasn't until after, with the Bulgarian entry into the war on October 1915, that this started to change. Following a successful offensive in which Serbia is wiped off the map, as the British never officially enters the war, Italy remains reluctant to enter the war and Austria-Hungary has troops available to attack both Montenegro and Albania as early as November. Because of the lack of naval adversaries, the Austrian navy has more possibilities along the Montenegrin and Albanian coast, able to cough, cut off any food imports into the country by sea. As a result of the naval blockade, the escape route of retreating Serbian army is cut off and it is little choice but to surrender. In the Middle East, things are messier for the Central Powers, with a Russian caucus campaign largely similar to the historical development with the British gone from the equation. After the Russian insistence, the French start the Alexandretta campaign in March 1915. After all, the Western Front isn't giving the French much excitement, so they must find it elsewhere. 
the French are able to take the area around Alexandretta. But attacks towards Aleppo and Adana are met with unexpectedly fierce Ottoman resistance, and the supply is hampered by German U-boat attacks. Nevertheless, the French are able to hold their position and block the important roads between Anatolia and Arabia, half splitting the Ottomans in half with a considerable amount of Ottoman troops bound off in non-Russian conflicts. The Russians are therefore able to conquer a considerable part of the Armenian highland by 1916. Sea-wise, things are a lot better for the central powers in this timeline. The German Kaiserliche Marine is blocking the Gulf of Finland and the White Sea and controls much of the Baltic and Black Sea. As a result, the Russians can hardly trade with foreign countries except through Ladivostok in the Far East. Only U-boats are used against the French in the Mediterranean, however, due to fears of dragging the British into the war by accident. However, Germany does send out some of the ships to protect its colonies from French attacks. Meanwhile, the French keep their fleet largely in the Mediterranean to maintain the blockade of the Adriatic Sea, and to supply the Alexandretta campaign and the hunting of German U-boats. Colonial warfare is largely limited here, but it's, it happens in Togoland and Cameroon. German Togoland is occupied by the French within two months after the start of the war, however an attempt to conquer German Cameroon in 1915 fails. German colonial troops are able to move the fighting to Kaboon, after the port city of Libreville is captured with the help of the Kaiserliche Marine, the battle is largely over. All in all, the war is going poorly for the Entente particularly massive amounts of lands lost and huge death tolls, naval blockades on the military routes, and immense social unrest. Demonstrators clamoring for bread takes to the street of Petrograd, and supported by huge crowds of striking industrial workers, the protesters clashes with police but refuses to leave the street. Days later, the troops of the Petrograd army garrison gets called out to quell the ops rising. In some encounters, the regiments opens fire, killing demonstrators, but the protesters stay on the streets and the troops began to waver. Finland seizes this opportunity to declare independence as the central government is occupied with the war and mass protests. In the end, the Russian Tsar decides to sign an armistice and the Duma forces a provisional government on March 15, 1916. A few days later, Tsar Nicholas abdicates the throne, nominally passing the throne to his son, while most powers stay in the hands of the provisional government. Unrest continues to grow as peasants loot farm and food rights erupt in the cities. The leaders of this provisional government, including the young Russian lawyer Alexander Kerensky and Minister of War, takes over the war effort. Seeing the war as hopeless and seeing the central powers nearing Petrograd, and wanting to quell riots, he begins peace negotiations. And two months later, in May, Russia sues for peace with the Central Powers, just in time for Russia to successfully harvest and distribute food during the summer and fall harvest seasons. A treaty is concluded at Charlottenburg Palace between the Central Powers and Russia. This is called the Treaty of Charlottenburg. The main points are that Poland becomes independent with a Habsburg monarch. Lithuania becomes independent with Wilhelm Karl, Duke of Urach, as king. The Baltic states, uh, Latvia and Estonia, is recognized as German protectorates. Finland is recognized as an independent kingdom. Romania gains modern-day Moldova. Russia withdraws from the Ottoman Empire and recognizes the Ottoman sovereignty within the 1914 borders. As a result of the Armenian question, the additional convention concerning the exchange of Armenian and Turkish populations will be signed. The remaining Armenian population settles in Russian Armenia. In return for the Turkish population of this area is expelled to the Ottoman Empire. This treaty, seeing this treaty being signed, France and the Balkans loses all hope, and the Treaty of Saint Souci with France is eventually concluded at the Sansushi Park between the Central Powers and France. The main points are that France renounces all claims to Alsace-Lorraine and recognizes the German annexation of Luxembourg. 
French will also pay a war indemnity of 5 billion gold francs. Germany, Germany will occupy Longvi and Brie until this debt is paid. France will withdraw from the Ottoman Empire and recognize Ottoman sovereignty within the 1914 borders. France will cede Gabon and French Congo to Germany, and in exchange, Germany cedes Togoland to France. There was then also a treaty with the Balkan nation, the Treaty of Berlin. This treaty is concluded at the Berlin Royal Palace between all countries in Central and Southeastern Europe. It mainly concerns the realignment of the borders in the Balkans. Austria-Hungary annexes northern Serbia and Montenegro. These countries will have the same status within Austria-Hungary as Bosnia and Herzegovina, a co-dominion between Austria and Hungary. This territory is expanded with Metohija and Ilsinj. Bulgaria will annex the remaining part of Serbia, uh, consisting of Nis, Kosovo and the Vardar Macedonian area. Austria will cede Galicia to the new Habsburg Kingdom of Poland. Austria will also cede Bukovina to Romania, and in exchange Romania returns the northern Dobrosia to Bulgaria. Northern Epirus is recognized as a part of Greece, as it has already been occupied by Greece for quite a long time. And finally, Albania becomes an Italian protectorate, and the Dokedenese is recognized as an Italian property. This counts as compensation for honoring the tripartite alliance. Because the peace negotiations have begun so much earlier in this timeline, Germany has no reason to smuggle Lenin into Russia from Switzerland as they did in our timeline after the February Revolution to undermine the war effort. This coupled with a return to food and normal production means there's no October Revolution, no civil war and no Bolshevik Soviet rule. The provisional government that got into power due to the Tsar's abdication is still faced with huge unrest and fear of violent social revolution, reforms society and establishes a liberal program of rights such as freedom of speech, equality before the law, and the rights of unions to organize and strike. The absence of a Russian communist revolution means no great political split inside the left of those who wished for a violent revolution or those who were satisfied with a gradual change and the strengthening of worker security. This means no Red Scare, a greater worker movement in the Western world, and no communist capitalist Cold War down the line. Beyond this, it's beyond me. For the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they received the time to really reform and survive. The kingdom will federalize over time, and the various parts will gain more and more autonomy. Many parts of the empire wanted this sort of arrangement, including the empire and the procreation part of the kingdom, but it only got big historically as a last-ditch effort to save the empire and passed only days before the empire's collapse. Had the empire survived just a little bit more, it could have very well worked. These states will gradually gain more and more autonomy and perhaps be semi-independent in the future. Or it will fail to reform and there will be a collapse. Regarding the colonies of Great Britain, the Netherlands and Belgium, they will be retained longer in this timeline, most likely, as they were not destroyed from the war and the respective countries retain finances to invest with. Many of these possessions will be more of a financial burden and only held for prestige and territorial denial towards enemies. And over time a lot of them will still gain independence and autonomy. But most likely key areas will likely stay under control, such as King Singapore for the UK, Djibouti for France, Dutch Suriname, uh, British Guiana and many smaller islands such as British Fiji as well as the more easily kept places such as Dutch Suriname. We'll most likely see a, we'll see a richer Italy compared to others because they were not involved in the war and they were able to both trade and do loans afterwards. So we might not see a rise of Mussolini in this timeline. One tenth, uh, one interesting little tidbit is that we most likely won't see uh, as a deadly Spanish flu in this timeline because there were no Americans to bring it over from Kansas and trenches for it to spread. The sickness was initially from Kansas, but it's only brought over during the war to the central powers and in the warfare and it spread to Spain and as Spain didn't want to control the information 
unlike the other countries, it became known as the Spanish flu because that was the only place with free journalism at the time. So instead it might just be called the Kansas pandemic or the 1918 influenza pandemic. Looking over Eastern Europe, the plan was for the Eastern countries, excluding Finland, join a sort of economic and military pact with Germany. They would join a customs union together. They would be kind of semi-puppet independent states where they would be highly aligned and, and dependent on Germany and the central powers. They would have mutual security clauses and they would be able to trade fairly freely. This would be a huge upgrade and a huge victory for independence for these states that were previously part of the US, the Russian Empire. These states would over time become more and more uh, self-ruling independent and there would be more of an equal relationship. I reckon that this economic union would result in one of the fastest growing economies in Europe and it could probably be fairly uh, well compared to the early Prussian and German customs and military unions. Looking over to the Ottoman Empire, they would probably be able to survive. In our timeline, they barely collapsed before the discovery of oil in the Middle East. Discovering these patches would make them all a lot richer and be able to keep power in both the Anatolian Peninsula, Istanbul, and probably the Arabian Peninsula and a bit down. One of the competitors would probably be Iran in this timeline, just like in our timeline. One of the big plans for this region was to connect Berlin to Baghdad. This was called the Berlin-Baghdad Pact. And they would build the railways all the way down so that the central powers could all be connected by railway and be able to transport goods and oil and other necessary things in between them, thus making much richer. These places would probably be heavily Germanized with German, German people in key posts and the Ottoman Empire would probably be heavily dependent on Germany and to some degree Austria-Hungary, but Austria-Hungary would also likely be somewhat dependent on Germany as they ended up being more and more dependent on Germany historically throughout World War I. Thank you. This is Leo. What do you think would have happened if the Central Powers won in World War I?